here uh, on CNBC TV18. You know, one of the silver linings uh, that Papi Barol of the IEA just spoke to me about in 2023 was the addition of renewable capacity, 50% being added in 2023, driven by countries like China and India. Uh, that gives you hope and confidence as the year uh, starts. Uh, yeah, Shereen. First of all, thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here in these, in in, these cold, in this cold, cold, cold now, times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. I think there is uh, room for optimism as far as the clean energy transition is concerned. Uh, a lot of it is being driven by China in terms of the amount of capacity that they're adding. Um, they're likely to add more than half the global capacity of renewables uh, last year and this year. Uh, India is not doing too badly either. India is also trying, uh, you know, its best. Uh, this year, we've already had almost 40 gigawatts of capacity being auctioned. Uh, hopefully, a couple of years down the road, when all of this capacity starts actually getting implemented. So, if you ask me, going forward, the bulk of new power capacity addition will be renewables. Uh, it's cheaper, it's cleaner, uh, and as you know, battery costs are also coming down. So, managing the intermittency and so on is going to be a lot more straightforward. So, I think. There's a lot of room for optimism on that score. But globally, are we going fast enough? The answer is no, we're not, clearly, right? Uh, and even though countries at G20 and at the uh, COP28 in Dubai uh, took this pledge of tripling renewable energy uh, by 2030, I think there's a lot of wood we need to chop before we get there. You know, let's talk about that wood that we need to chop. So what will be on the priority list? What are you going to be watching out for? You know, there are several things. First of all, I think one of the issues is, is around supply chain diversification. I think everybody knows that China accounts for a large part of the supply chain right now, and that is not a healthy dependence that we have. So we need to find other centers, either India or the U.S. or, or whatever, where we can actually start developing these capacities in terms of both solar and wind turbines and so on. In addition, we have issues around critical minerals. How do we, as India, for example, get a hand on those which is independent of mm. coming from, let's say, China. So I think that's one area that we have to watch out for. Uh, the second is, you know, there are lots of innovations that are going on right now. We're now having tenders in renewable energy uh, where we're being asked to provide uh, the, the kind of profile that a DISCOM usually requires to supply to its customers. So we're actually now fully able to sculpt renewable energy projects uh, and the output from that in a way to mimic what is actually the demand side requirement. And that then makes it much easier to absorb renewables. So you have a lot of those kinds of innovations that will be happening going forward as well. And I think the third thing is financing. Financing is inevitably the big uh, elephant as well in the room. We need trillions of dollars globally every year. Uh, that's never been done before in any sector in the history of the world. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, needing three to four trillion dollars uh, a year. India will need at least a couple of hundred billion dollars a year as well. Uh, so we need financing coming from all sources and therefore and what is happens is that a here? concern, uh, you know, given the macroeconomic headwinds and higher it is, it is, it is absolutely, so so no, absolutely, you know, you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, one of the biggest problems that we have right now for the renewable energy sector globally is that all valuations have come down because ours is a capital intensive sector and, uh, and as interest rates have gone up, all renewable energy stocks have gone down. And we need to raise all of these trillions of dollars of capital to fund new mm. projects. How can we do that if, in fact, the equity markets are where they are? Now, this is globally. In India, the situation is somewhat different. Right. But the good news is that at least private markets are pretty robust. And a lot of uh, large global funds are raising infrastructure funds or mm. climate funds. That money can be deployed into our sector as well. But uh, we need to also look at what happens in multilateral bank reforms yeah. because if you want more money going into the global yeah. south, we need the multilaterals to come in and, you know, give that risk mitigation that is required to, to channelize a lot of that capital. Well, that certainly is the hope and the expectation now that the expert group has presented its report, and which has been uh, accepted as well. But uh, uh, let's talk about priorities for mm -hmm. Renew in 2024. Uh, you know, what is the outlook? What's the target? What are you focused on? Well, you know, for us, it's very simple. It's all about execution. I think that there is enough capacity for us to pick up. Uh, as I said, the government has been doing a lot of auctions in these auctions, and this is all public information. In the last financial year, or in the, the current financial year, we picked up almost five gigawatts of new bid wins. Uh, so that takes our total, uh, you know, pipeline, including bid wins, to almost close to about nine to ten gigawatts. All of that has to be built out in the next two to three years. Mm -hmm. As you know, execution in India is always challenging at the best of times, and so therefore, executing all of this, two to three gigawatts a year is going to be mm -hmm. something that we'll have to really focus on intensely. 
land you know, acquisition, transmission, etc. I mean, it's, it's the usual stuff. It's not exciting, but that's really where the <laughs> energy the transition <laughs> meets the road or, or the rubber meets the road. So that's the kind of areas that we really have to focus on. And you know, sometimes when I sit in a lot, on a lot of these global conversations on climate change and so on, yeah. the reality is that's where the work has to be done. We need to actually do these hard infrastructure projects. We have to build roads. We have to take the turbines out into the fields and, and put them up. And that's, that's a challenging task. Well, you know, speaking of challenges, uh, geopolitics and, of course, in the immediate term, what's happening in the Middle East, etc., will have an impact as far as energy markets are concerned, even though production is expected to outpace uh, demand because demand is weaker uh, at this point in time and production growth higher. But, you know, the political outcome of what happens in the U.S., for instance, uh, with the presidential elections, the impact and the implications of these factors on the energy markets, on the renewable market? Uh, I think it's going to be pretty immense. Uh, and I think obviously in India we have elections, but I think we all know what the outcome is going to be. And the good news is that we'll have continuity. So that's, that's going to be terrific. But there are also elections in places like Taiwan has obviously happened, Indonesia, yeah. the UK, and the US, most yes. importantly, right? And the US is really where we can have the biggest swing. We can have continuity of current policies or we can have a totally different uh, situation coming in. And that, I think, is in a, in a way the joker in the pack. And I think there is going to be a lot of uncertainty based on the polling data mm. leading into November of this year. And I think a lot of countries will start positioning themselves ahead of time for what happens then. Um, and that will have significant ramifications on how both the wars play out, both in the, 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 the Middle East as well as in Ukraine. Those can get settled very quickly or they can carry on, potentially, we don't know. Uh, and that then will have, I think, implications for energy markets around the world that we can't really fully anticipate right now. All we can, be, all we can do is to be aware of these, these issues and just carry on. I think India is somewhat insulated from what's ha what, what is likely to happen globally. That's good for us. But globally, I think it's going to be a pretty significant uh, event risk. Well, adding to the uncertainty that uh, the world is already grappling with. Suman Sina, always a pleasure. Many thanks for joining us here in Davos. Appreciate your time. And we wish you the very best of luck for 2024. Thank you, Shireen. And best of luck for sitting out here <laughs> and dealing with the cold. Well, forward. thank you. We need lots of, lots of luck. <laughs> but uh, we are going to come back with more conversations here. As you can see, plenty more headliners joining us in Davos. Back in a minute.